Good morning, I'm Debbie Hasdorf, and I'm the pastor here at Parkview United Church of Christ. And on behalf of the congregation, I want to welcome you to worship this morning. We're really glad that you're here with us. Whoever you are, wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome and you are wanted here. I want to begin with an announcement. Um, next week is going to be All Saints Day. We're going to be worshiping um, virtually and, um, and doing our usual um, All Saints Day celebration where we remember people who have meant, meant something to us in our lives and who have passed into the arms of God. We especially remember those people who've lost someone this year, and it's important this year because so many people haven't been able to have funerals or um, be together after a loss. So it's another opportunity to, to be together and to share, um, share, our, each other's, share each other's concerns. So um, if you'd like to send a picture in, um, we're going to be doing that um, by, it has to be in by Monday, October 26th. Um, Kim will be putting together a PowerPoint presentation and we'd like it if you'd send in a picture with the name of the person and your name so that we can, we can put them in the, in the slide presentation. This is a very meaningful thing to me to see all the people who have mattered to you and um, it, I think it's a, it's a wonderful way to remember all the people who have been mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters with us in Christ. So let us begin. For our opening today, I have an opening call to worship, and I'm going to do both parts. Let us begin. God of our ancestors made a promise long ago that God's steadfast love endures forever. God has made known to us in Jesus Christ, our Lord. God's steadfast love endures forever. God continues to be revealed by the Holy Spirit. God's steadfast love endures forever. Come, may we worship God who was and who is and who is to come, the Almighty whose love endures forever. Amen. And now we're going to begin with a hymn. Our scripture lesson today is part of the story of Moses. And so we're going to sing the hymn when Israel was in Egypt's land. And um, Heather Cogswell is going to lead us in the hymn, and you'll see the words in front of you on the screen. I invite you to join us. Okay? <laughs> Let my 
gift to be simple, tis the gift to be free, tis the gift to come down where we are to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, twill be in the valley of love and delight. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend we shan't be ashamed to turn. Turn will be our delight Till by turning, turning we come round right Tis the gift to be loving Tis the best gift of all Like a quiet rain It blesses where it falls And with it we will truly believe Tis better to give Than it is to receive When true simplicity is gained To bow and to bend we shan't be ashamed To turn, turn will be our delight Till by turning, turning we come round right Tis a gift to be simple, tis a gift to be fair Tis a gift to wake and breathe the morning air each day that we walk on the path that we choose, tis a gift we pray we shall never lose. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend we shan't be ashamed. To turn, turn will be our delight. Till by turning, turning we come round right. Our scripture lesson today is from the book of Deuteronomy, the Old Testament, the 34th chapter, the 1st through the 12th verses. And I'm going to be reading from Eugene Peterson's paraphrase, The Message. Moses climbed from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo the peak of Pisgah facing Jer Jericho. God showed him all the land from Gilead to Dan, all of Naphtali, Ephraim, and Manasseh, all of Jericho reaching to the Mediterranean Sea, the Negev and the plains which encircled Jer Jericho, city of palms, as far south as Zoar. Then and there God said to him, this is the land I promised to your ancestors, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob with the words, I will give it to your descendants. I've let you see it with your own eyes. There it is, but you are not going to go in. Moses died there in the land of Moab. Moses, the servant of God, just as God said, God buried him in the valley of the land of the Moab, opposite Bath Peor. No one knows where his burial site is to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyesight was sharp. He still walked with a spring in his step. The people of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab for 30 days. Then the days of weeping and mourning for Moses came to an end. Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. The people of Israel listened obediently to him and did the same as when God had commanded Moses. No prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom God knew face to face. Never since has there been anything like the signs and miracle wonders that God sent him to do in Egypt, to Pharaoh, to all his servants, and to all his land. Nothing to compare with that all-powerful hand of his and all the great and terrible things Moses did as every eye of Israel watched. Amen. <clears throat> I am a born and bred low church Christian. Raised a Presbyterian, converted to Congregationalism, I worship best in a modern, a, a modest, unadorned, clear-windowed, paned sanctuary with architecture that teaches the presence of God in the ordinary. 
Stained glass and high ceilings are for high church Episcopalians and Catholics. Their architecture evokes the highness of God and the smallness of human beings. I love taking confirmation kids to the basilica and watching their eyes pop. But even we low church Christians can stand in awe in a great cathedral. One of the things that I like best about the great cathedrals of Europe is that it took several centuries to build them. No one individual was there from beginning to end. Generations of carpenters, roofers, stonemasons worked on these great cathedrals. A young boy might sign on as an apprentice, learn the trade by practicing it every day, week in, week out, year after year, teach his children who would apprentice and then work beside him on the facade or the roof or the stone carvings. And in time, a grandchild would begin the process. And when the old man died, his work would be continued on and on. Even the vision of the cathedral and the architect's plans and specs were evolving throughout this intergenerational project. With very few exceptions, the names of the original architects and builders are not known. No one knows who built Chartres or Salisbury. Preacher John Buchanan says, what invariably moves my soul about a great cathedral, Chartres, Notre Dame, Canterbury, is not only the soaring majesty, the massive size and intricate stone masonry, the sheer miracle that were, they were built at all, but the important fact that individuals gave the entirety of their lives to the project, individuals who were, ne who were neither there at the beginning nor the end of the project. It sounds like something the great American theologian Reinhold Niebuhr once said, nothing that is worth doing can be achieved in a lifetime, therefore we must be saved by hope. Today's story from Deuteronomy is the story of an intergenerational relationship between God and the people of Israel. John Buchanan tells the story of Moses like this. In today's scripture lesson, Moses is at the end of his life. He is one of the towering figures in the history of the Israelite people. Moses' life began in the midst of political terrorism when the king of Egypt ordered the slaughter of all the Jewish babies. And Moses' mother and sister placed him in a small basket, floated him on the river to be saved by Pharaoh's own daughter. Raised in the Egyptian royal household, but aware of his Hebrew identity, Moses rose through the ranks of Egyptian government. When he saw an Egyptian abusing one of his own countrymen, who were now virtual slaves in Israel, in Egypt, he killed the abuser and fled for his own life. He married, settled down to a quiet life as a shepherd in the wilderness where God caught up with him. A bush was burning and a voice called his name. Moses, who are you? Moses asked. And the answer is one of the most profound theological truths of all time. I am who I am. I am who I will be. These are the words of monotheism, the start of a conversation and an experience of God's transcendence. God is the great unknown. God is so big that God can only be described, so present that God cannot be seen. Later, Moses will ask to see God fully and is allowed only to see the backside of God, not God's face. These mystical religious experiences were not intended for Moses' entertainment or his education. God comes to Moses in order to get Moses to do something. The voice orders Moses to return to Egypt to lead God's people to freedom. Moses argues, whines, makes excuses, doubts, and finally does it, leading the people of Israel out of Egypt through the Sea of Reeds with the Egyptian army in hot pursuit into the wilderness. Now the reluctant military liberator has to become a politician. The people are frightened, hungry, and thirsty. Moses must convince them that the risks and hardships are freedom uh, and that the risks and hardships of freedom are better than the security of slavery. 
through the barren wasteland of the Sinai Peninsula, the entire company travels for decades, a pilgrim people on the move from campsite to campsite, oasis to oasis, up and down the peninsula, traveling without a home. At the Sinai, Moses' mysterious relationship with the I am who I am voice continues. A law is given, a covenant is made and broken and renewed. And the pilgrimage continues. And now it is almost over. They have arrived at Mount Nebo, a striking outcrop to the east of the Dead Sea at Jericho. From its heights, you can see in four directions a breathtaking view of the land behind and ahead, the promised land, the past and the future. Moses is not going to enter this land which he has been pursuing for 40 years. He will not personally experience the completion of this project that has required so much of him. Skills, courage, strength, creativity have all been required on this long journey. But Moses' work is done. Or more accurately, Moses' part of the work of creation is at an end. And Moses, his eyes undimmed and his vigor undiminished, having seen the promised land from the mountaintop, he dies. He is buried somewhere there. The people mourn his death for 30 days and then move into the future with their new leader. Nothing worth doing can be completed in a lifetime. It's a good thing to remember. The work that you and I are privileged to do in our job, in our profession, in education, in the arts, in our families, in our community, that work began long ago before us. And by grace, it will continue after we are gone. It's one of the things that I found to be most sacred and most true about church. We talk about a cloud of witnesses, those people in the history of Christianity, in the story, in the values and traditions of our country, in the genealogies of our families, in the story of the creation of our beloved church, the story of Parkview UCC. These people who went before us spent their whole lives building a legacy here that we have received to carry on a legacy of strengths and weaknesses, a history of great challenges and great struggles, an inheritance of mistakes forgiven and blessings fulfilled, a few broken hearts, a touch of unresolved conflict, things left undone that maybe should have been done, but lives changed, beauty created, faith made strong enough for life. Those people who went before us picked up the baton and began the race, passing it to us so that we can pass it on to someone else someday. It was a song that was there before we added our voices and will continue after our voices are silent. When I was a junior in high school, I had the best social studies teacher ever. Her name was Ms. Martin, and she, was, she had my class of juniors for a full year. Everything I know about civics, I know because of Ms. Martin. During these last few years of endless American politics, I've gone to th back to think a lot about Ms. Martin and about all that I learned from her. It's funny because I don't think I even thought very much about her. I don't think I've thought about her for years until all of this happened in our politics. Everything I know about divided government, about the Constitution, about checks and balances, about how to make a law, about the differences between conservatives and liberals, about the criminal justice system. Most of the things that I, most of what I know about all these things that mean a lot to me and I hope mean a lot to you, I know because Miss Martin was a tough teacher and she took her civics seriously. She had a tradition of every spring loading up all the juniors, civic students, and taking them to downtown Houston, Texas, to the courthouse, the Harris County Courthouse. And we were set loose with bag lunches to watch court trials. We were given strict instructions as to the proper etiquette for being in a courtroom, but we had no assignments but to go, to, but to go and listen and watch. Four hours of sitting in, in, in courtrooms 
listening to all different kinds of cases, made quite an impression on the still-forming mind of this young citizen and taught me a respect and appreciation of our judicial system, imperfect as it is. Ms. Martin was so awesome that she showed us the Magruder tapes and led us through a discussion of the conspiracy theories around the assassination of President Kennedy. I remember a fascinating discussion on the role of the FBI in the Justice Department. I had to write a paper on the platforms of the Republican and Democrat parties in the 1976 elections, Jimmy Carter and Gerald Ford. I didn't understand what a big part of my education, what an important part of who I am came from Ms. Martin until I realized that not everyone learns civics so thoroughly. I looked on the internet to see if I could find her so that I could write her a letter and tell her how much she had meant to me and how much I had learned in her class. But I can't find her because I don't know her first name. Teachers change lives. Teachers change, shape civilizations. Teachers open windows in the minds of their students that change the world. And yet most of us don't even know their first names. What we care about and deeply love and work to strengthen and preserve will go on after us. The church, the nation, the institutions we love, our business, our professions, our family. Peter Gomes, a very famous preacher, said, few of us can orchestrate the conclusion of our lives, and all of us will die with our work undone, our dreams unachieved. We may not be able to make an end, but by God's grace, we are able to make a beginning, and that is no small thing. This week, I watched a, a wonderful show called Tell Me More that's on PBS, and it's a show about a, a really engaging interviewer. Her name is Kelly Corrigan. She's written some books, and she does an incredible interview. And this week, she interviewed um, actress Jennifer Garner, who I had admi have admired from afar but didn't know very much about. Um, Jennifer has three young children, and they had a really interesting conversation about raising children in a ta time like this. So I want to share with you what they said. Um, Kelly Corgan, the interview, said, so this is just the weirdest year on record, and I'm sure you spent more time with your kids this year than any other time, maybe. What worries about your kid, you about your kids growing up in this time? And Garner says, sadness. Doesn't everybody, aren't you worried that your about your kids being home and siloed and not able to be out? Are they going to be sad, and are they going to carry that sadness with them? And Corrigan said, yes, and I worry that they're going to feel forever in unsure of their future. There was already this heaviness around global warming, which is totally, completely, terrifyingly, and rightly so. And it's totally appropriate to be terrified. It's like we just had this foolish sense growing up that like it was going to be pretty much like this the rest of our lives. And now we think maybe, and now we think maybe not, maybe there's another pandemic behind this one and it's going to be worse. So right now, how do you even address that kind of anxiety? How do you take one step and what does that one step lead to? Like it leads to another step. And that's why I think that modeling, which is something Jennifer Gardner has been doing with the charity Save the Children, it's like you're not going to save every child, but you're going to save some. You're going to make an incremental difference. And seeing someone make an, in, an incremental difference makes you want to make an incremental difference too. And that's the way that the whole thing starts to turn. And that's the tipping point idea. I love this idea of incrementalism. I find it both freeing and motivating. Freeing that in the problems that we live with, climate change, racism, meanness, poverty, all the big problems came into existence incrementally. So we are a part of a long intergenerational chain of bad choices and good choices that have led us to where we are today. Think about that around global warming. Choices that we've been making for generations across de decades, even centuries, have led us to this place where we are. And maybe the way out is through incremental change. I, to me, it's freeing to think about incrementalism. 
I did not do this alone. I am not only to blame, and I do never deserve all the credit. But I can do something. I can make choices, and my choices can make a difference. And together, we can reach a tipping point when real change happens. Incrementalism is grace, and it's also hope. Hope that things can change if we change. And somewhere in all of that, there is this view from the top of the mountain, past and future, a sense that we are a part of a history that is bigger than our own, that the story of our own families begins before us, includes us for a while, and will go on after us, and that the story of our families is a part of the story of the larger human family, the human race, and of God, and of God's mysterious, wondrous relationship with all God's people. John Buchanan, the pastor, says again, whenever I read or hear a story of Moses on Mount Nebo, I think of my grandfather Buchanan, my father's father. Pop, we called him, a big, strong man who worked in the Pennsylvania radio, Railroad steam engine shop, worked all his life building the K-4 and other workhouse, workhorse steam engines of American railroading. He had big arms and hands and shoulders, pure white hair, enormous ears, smoked a pipe, and lived well into his 90s. Buchanan says, I was a young minister when he began his final ascent to Mount Nebo. Home on vacation, my father and I went to see him. My dad went daily to take care of him. He was bed, bed fast now, sitting up, looking out his window. We talked about family, the weather, baseball, the future. It's almost over for me, he said, but not for you. And I'm proud of what you are. My father asked me to pray, and I did. We kissed goodbye. I would not see him again. He knew it, and I did too. As we left, he raised his hand in what amounted to a kind of blessing. I always thought he, sa he said a line from a hymn he must have sung a thousand times. God be with you till we meet again, Johnny. What do you think that Moses saw when he was standing up there at the top of Mount Nebo? He could see Jericho, of course. He could see the promised land. But he could also see the Dead Sea to the west and the Great Plain immediately to the north. I think that more than that, I think he saw for a moment at least all the way to Judah, perhaps to a small town called, Jerusalem, called Bethlehem. I think that he saw and knew that God's way of creating and redeeming creation would go on, that his labor, Moses' labor, was not in vain. I think he saw across the miles and the centuries to the birth of his, one of his people, Jesus. He saw all the way to that place where the dark streets shone an everlasting light and in which the hopes and fears of all the years were meant that night. Nothing worth doing, the great theologian said, can be accomplished in a lifetime. Therefore, we must be saved by hope. Nothing true or beautiful or good makes sense in the immediate context of history. Therefore, we must be saved by faith. Nothing we do, however virtuous, can be accomplished alone. Therefore, we are saved by love. Thanks be to God. Amen. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. While the hope of endless glory fills my heart with joy and love, Teach me ever to adore thee, may I still thy goodness prove. Oh, to grace how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let that grace now, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the Lord I love. Here 
Here's my heart, O oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Come, thou fount of every vision, lift our eyes to what may come. See the lion and the young lamb dwell together in thy home. Hear the cry of war fall silent, feel the love glow like a sun. When we all serve one another, then our heaven has begun. This is the time in our service and our time together when we, we calm, calm down our busy minds and we listen to our beating hearts and we try to focus on what it is that is most important to us the people that we love, the things that concern us, the ways that we are brought joy, the ways in which we suffer. And we share all those joys and concerns with each other, believing that our love for each other will reach God through our prayers. So today I have some prayer concerns to share with you. Um, the first one is for Kate Sommer. Some of you have been listening. We've been praying for Kate now for, I think, a month. And she's still in the hospital and is still um, battling West Nile disease. Um, here's what her, her brother had to say this morning. She said, Kate was off the breathing tube yesterday when I saw her in the morning. She had to be intubated again last evening. When I saw her this morning, she was... She was still intubated to keep her comfortable and the sedation was making her pretty groggy. That gave me a chance to talk to her nurse for a while. She said that the West Nile virus was disturbing the ability of her brain to communicate with her lungs. Specifically, they mentioned that the diaphragm wasn't working properly. The nurse indicated that she will probably be in ICU for a little while longer and then perhaps to an intermediate care room. She's also developed some, pneumo some pneumonia but it's an additional concern, and she's being treated with antibiotics for the pneumonia. She said, I, sent, I read Kate some cards that arrived yesterday, and I also read notes that had been sent to her, and she enjoyed those. Thank you for them. A deep and abiding prayer for Kate um, as she goes through a time of incredible trial. We pray for all of the medical professionals who are um, working, working with her, we ask that you guide them, O oh God, that you might find um, a reason for all of this, that you might find a way to bring healing to her broken lungs and her broken body. And we pray that she might know that she is loved, that she is held in prayer, that so many people care about her, so many lives have been touched by her life, so that she might know that she is never alone and that she is loved. For Kate, we hold you in the light of Christ. And Vern Hagel called this week to say that um, he had gotten the results back from the biopsy on the kidney that was removed, and there was indeed um, cancer inside the kidney, but there was no evidence that it had spread outside of the kidney. So that means he won't be needing to have chemotherapy or radiation. Um, he's, he's in really good shape. And he sounds like he's doing really well, strong voice, and um, he's getting around um, his family, his kids are taking care of him, and um, he's doing really well. So prayers of gratitude to God for Vern, for the good news, and for the healing that's happening. For Vern, we hold you in the light of Christ. And then, um, let's see what else I have. Oh, um, I wanted to um, lift up some birthdays that are happening. Do one blue candle for that. Um, Earl Larson has a birthday this week. Um, Doc Wynn had a birthday this week. Ivan Beek had a birthday this week. Jean McBride has a birthday this week. And Amber and Stephanie Tice have a birthday this week. So we give thanks to all of them. It's especially nice because we don't see each other to bring these people to our minds on their birthdays and give thanks for how much that is, they mean to us and how good it is to have them a part of our lives. For all of our friends who are having birthdays this week, we hold you in the light of Christ. Let's be together in prayer. 
begin with the prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. We pray this in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, our time together this week has come to an end. I'm so thankful that you've been here with me, with us tonight. I'm so thankful for the church community that is Parkview. I'm thank, thankful also for all the support and love that goes through the atmosphere, goes through the prayers, goes through the intentions of all the people in our congregation as they seek to support and love each other during a hard time. We ask that you let us know how things are going, keep in touch. If there's anything the church can do to be helpful, if there's anything I can do to be helpful, I really invite you to give the church a call and let us know. I'll be back in touch and we'd be happy to help. And if we can't do it, there's lots of people here at church who would like to be a part of helping other people. So now we're going to end with a benediction and then we're going to have a sung benediction. God be with you till we meet again. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you and make God's face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and grant you God's peace. Amen. <laughs>